Welcome to Miami University's online training program for general laboratory safety. It is common for students, especially those just starting out, to be uncomfortable or even embarrassed asking for help when they are uncertain of something or when they are concerned about the safety of a situation or procedure. When it comes to safety, making a mistake can have severe consequences. So if you have any uncertainties or any questions, it is your responsibility to raise them. Ask another student or a faculty member for your safety and for the safety of others. When in doubt, just ask. The purpose of this training is to review general laboratory hazards, practices, and procedures to ensure you are able to work safely in the laboratory. Following good laboratory practices not only helps to ensure your safety, but also the safety of others working around you. Some of the topics reviewed in this training include regulatory information and where to find it, maintaining good housekeeping and work practices, specific hazards encountered in the lab setting, good use of safety technology, also known as engineering controls, the selection of proper personal protective equipment, and how to respond in case of an emergency. All laboratory work performed at Miami University is regulated by Miami University's Chemical Hygiene Plan, or CHP. The CHP establishes guidelines for the handling and storage of chemicals, for procedures that involve heavy and or sensitive equipment, and for general work practices in laboratories where chemicals are used or stored. The plan is available online at Miami's Environmental Health and Safety Offices, or EHSO, website. The CHP was developed under the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA's, lab standard. Development of Miami's CHP was also informed by Ohio state law and generally accepted industry standards. This training course builds on prudent practices in the laboratory, a publication that addresses physical as well as chemical hazards in the laboratory. This publication is available from Miami University's Environmental Health and Safety Office. Every laboratory should have an emergency procedures handbook located either by the door or next to the telephone nearest the door. The handbook is a quick flip chart guide to contact numbers relevant in responding to medical emergencies, dangerous chemical spills, natural gas leaks, fires, and more. Familiarity with one's surroundings is the simplest aspect of safe work practices, and it is crucial to good laboratory safety. This means your first priority, if you are new to a research lab, is to determine the location of all nearby exits, as well as the nearest eyewash, safety shower, fire extinguisher, and first aid kit. You should also know the location of the nearest telephone in case you need to call for help. Remember that the hallways in most instructional buildings at Miami have campus phones available. In an emergency, a quick response is critical. Another simple yet important aspect of laboratory safety is good housekeeping. Keeping work areas and floors uncluttered and free of obstructions will reduce your chance of an accident. Aisleways should be kept clear of trip hazards such as extension cords, empty boxes, and waste containers. Make sure emergency equipment is easily accessible. Care should be taken to store equipment and chemicals properly. Simply storing chemicals alphabetically can result in incompatible chemicals being stored together. For example, this approach would put phosphorus, an ignition source, and pentane, a highly flammable liquid, next to each other on the same shelf. All chemicals should first be segregated by hazard class, such as flammable, oxidizer, etc. Be sure the lid or cap is replaced when you are finished dispensing a chemical and that the container is closed tightly. Wastes need to be segregated and labeled properly. Make sure they are easily identifiable and that incompatible wastes are not stored together. Completely fill out a waste collection record as you add to a larger collection container so that the danger of its transport and disposal can be adequately assessed. Spills always need to be cleaned up immediately. If for some reason you have to leave an area before the spill can be cleaned up, 
tell someone in authority, such as a lab supervisor or a faculty member, exactly where the spill is and what it is. If an emergency arises, the worst situation for a responder to encounter is a call to clean up a spill of unknown origin. We will now review the types of hazards encountered during normal operation of a research laboratory. Laboratory hazards can be categorized into three major groups, physical, biological, and chemical. We will identify some of the more common hazards of each type that everyone should be familiar with before starting work in the lab. Make sure you are able to recognize electrical hazards and use work practices that won't create one. Frayed or damaged electrical cords should be replaced. Equipment that induces tingling on contact with bare skin needs to be taken out of service and inspected by a qualified electrician. This indicates the equipment has exposed internal wiring that could turn deadly if used in an environment where you are grounded, such as in contact with the wet surface. Make sure that electrical circuits are not overloaded and that surge protectors, power strips, and extension cords are not plugged into each other. This is often referred to as daisy chaining. If you are going to be working with equipment in wet locations, make sure the electrical outlet is ground fault circuit interrupt, or GFCI, protected. These outlets are designed to shut off when a sudden surge of power passes through them. They are easily identified by the red reset button built into the outlet. GFCIs are also available on extension cords. If you will be conducting field work using electrical equipment and a GFCI protected outlet is not available, make sure you use a GFCI protected cord. One OSHA standard that is often associated with electrical safety is the lockout tagout standard. This standard is designed to ensure that before work begins on a piece of equipment, Electrical power is physically locked out, and a tag is affixed to the lock that identifies the person responsible. In the laboratory environment, this generally means unplugging the equipment and keeping it unplugged while you work on it. However, keep in mind that some equipment may have stored energy that can be released in the course of working on the equipment. Stored energy may take the form of hydraulic or pneumatic pressure, or mechanical energy. Compressed gas cylinders are a common sight in research laboratories and potentially one of the most hazardous items you will encounter. Before working with compressed gases, you should be familiar with some of their hazards. The most obvious is that the gas is under high pressure, so cylinders should always be transported upright with the valve cap in place to protect the valve from damage. Damage to the valve stem can lead to a sudden release of pressure effectively making the cylinder a projectile. Also remember that cylinders come in a variety of sizes, with the largest cylinders weighing up to 141 pounds empty. You should always be familiar with the nature of the gas you are using. Some gases, such as nitrogen and carbon dioxide, are simple asphyxiants. This means they can be hazardous by displacing oxygen in the room. Other gases, such as carbon monoxide, Hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen cyanide are chemical asphyxiants. These gases are hazardous at much lower concentrations because they interfere with your body's ability to transport and use oxygen. Some gases, such as ammonia, are irritants, while others, like acetylene and hydrogen, are explosive. In short, compressed gases come with multiple hazards. When working with compressed gases, be certain that all cylinders, empty or full, are anchored to a stable surface, such as a lab bench, as shown, or directly to a wall. Regulators are unique to the type of gas being used. For example, the threads on regulators for explosive gases, such as hydrogen and oxygen, are reversed from the threads on regulators for non-hazardous gases, such as nitrogen or helium. The interior materials of each type of regulator are tailored to each type of gas, and therefore it is important that you never make any adaptations to a regulator. If it doesn't fit, there is a good chance it is the wrong one. Proper use of a gas regulator requires understanding what you are looking at. There are two gauges on the regulator. The one closest to the cylinder measures the pressure inside the cylinder, 
which is proportional to the amount of gas remaining. A full cylinder contains approximately 2,000 psi. This will read zero if the cylinder valve is closed. The other gauge measures the pressure of the gas being delivered at the exit of the regulator. The delivered pressure can be adjusted by rotating the large knob in the center, clockwise to increase the pressure, counterclockwise to decrease the pressure. The on-off needle valve allows the user to turn the gas on or off without adjusting the pressure settings. When you finish working with any compressed gas, you should first close the cylinder valve and then bleed off any remaining pressure. Both gauges should go to zero, as shown. Cryogenic materials are characterized by extremely low temperatures, down to negative 269 degrees Celsius, or 4 Kelvin. Liquid nitrogen and solid carbon dioxide, otherwise known as dry ice, are the two most common cryogens used in the laboratory. The most obvious hazard when working with these materials is the danger of frostbite. However, there are several other hazards you should be aware of. For example, the rapid release of cryogens in a confined area can quickly displace the air in that space and create the potential for asphyxiation. Liquid oxygen can create an atmosphere that is ripe for combustion in the presence of an ignition source. The extremely low temperatures also make structural materials brittle and therefore more prone to failure. You will be surrounded by glass. Always carefully inspect all glassware before using it. Chipped or cracked glassware is more likely to fail or shatter, especially if heated. Any damaged glassware should be disposed of immediately in an appropriate disposal box, like that shown here. Never dispose of broken glassware or sharps, such as syringe needles, directly into the trash where they could potentially injure an unsuspecting coworker or custodian. The use of radioactive materials is strictly regulated. This includes radiation-generating equipment such as X-ray diffractometers. Only a radiation-generating equipment supervisor can train students on this equipment. In order to perform work involving radioactive materials at any level, additional radiation-specific training is required. Contact the Radiation Safety Office at 529-2812 for more information concerning course dates and times. Sharps such as needles and razor blades need to be disposed of properly in a sharps container. Any rigid container that is puncture resistant can be used as a sharps container as long as it is clearly and properly labeled with the word sharps. If the item you are discarding has been contaminated with an infectious agent, it needs to be treated as infectious waste. These items must be disposed of in a sharps container that has been properly labeled for biohazards like the one in this photo. The EPA defines an infectious agent as any type of microorganism, helminth, or virus that causes or significantly contributes to increased morbidity or mortality in human beings. If you plan to work with an infectious agent, you will need to make special arrangements with EHSO to have your waste disposed of properly. The level of containment required to work safely with a biological agent corresponding to its potential danger to its surrounding environment is defined as its biological safety level, or BSL. The levels range from 1 to 4, with 1 being the least dangerous and 4 the most dangerous. It is unlikely you will encounter any research above BSL2 occurring here on campus at Miami. Anywhere work above this level of danger is ongoing will be clearly posted. A number of select agents, mostly pathogens and biological toxins, have been declared by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services or the U.S. Department of Agriculture to have the potential to pose a severe threat to public health and safety. Consequently, any person planning work involving these select agents or toxins or recombinant DNA, or requiring facilities above BSL-2 level, must first receive approval from Miami University's Institutional Biosafety Committee. A link to the complete list of regulated agents can be found on the IBC homepage. 
If you plan to use animals in your research, you must first receive training and approval from Miami's Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. We will now examine the hazards associated with handling chemicals. The two common hazard labeling systems are the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA, Fire Diamond on the left, and the Hazardous Materials Identification System, or HMIS, label on the right. Every chemical, as it is received from the manufacturer, bears one of these labels. Both of these systems use colors to group chemicals into different hazard categories, assigning each a number ranging from zero, indicating minimal hazard, to four, indicating a severe hazard. Over the next few slides, we will compare the two systems more closely. It is important to remember that many chemicals are hazardous in more than one way, so knowledge of specific hazards is crucial to your safety. Both systems use the color red to designate flammability, defined as how readily a solid, liquid, vapor, or gas will ignite and burn. Examples of common, highly flammable solvents include acetone, toluene, methanol, ethanol, ether, and xylene. Both systems use blue to designate a health hazard, defined as the toxicity of a substance. Examples of toxic substances include chlorine, hydrofluoric acid, hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen sulfide, sulfuric acid, and phenol. Each of these examples works on different parts of the body and therefore presents a different health hazard. For example, chlorine gas burns the tissue of the lungs on contact, while hydrogen fluoride dissolves bone. We will discuss ways to protect yourself from these hazards a little later on. The fire diamond and the HMIS system differ in how they identify reactive chemicals. The fire diamond uses the yellow square to convey chemical reactivity and does not distinguish between picric acid, which is shock sensitive, and sodium, which reacts violently with water and oxygen. The HMIS system uses the color orange to identify any of the seven physical hazard categories defined by OSHA. These categories are water reactives, organic peroxides, explosives, compressed gases, pyrophoric materials, oxidizers, and unstable reactives. Each is scored on a 1 to 4 scale. The white section of the labels is where the two systems differ the most. The NFPA fire diamond uses this area to convey a limited set of special hazards, such as the letters OX for oxidizer, or a W with a line through it to signify violent water reactivity. In contrast, the HMIS label uses this section to define exactly what level of personal protective equipment, from face shields to gloves to full body suits, is required to work with a particular chemical. In the preceding section, we discussed the types of hazards you are likely to encounter in the laboratory. In many cases, these hazards are inherent to the experiments at hand, so we need to discuss ways in which you can limit your exposure and protect yourself and your coworkers. The most obvious advice is to develop and maintain good work habits. This means you should not be eating, drinking, smoking, chewing gum, or applying cosmetics, including lotions and perfumes, while you are working in the lab. Any chemicals on your hands are easily ingested. Many toxic chemicals are readily absorbed through the skin. Use only mechanical devices to pipette, never your mouth. Avoid working in the lab alone, especially after hours. Never work alone if hazardous chemicals or equipment are being used. <coughs> you should be familiar with the hazards of the materials you will be using before you use them. Your research advisor should be your first source of information, followed by the scientific literature. This information is collected in the Material Safety Data Sheet, or MSDS. Each chemical is shipped with an MSDS, which outlines the safety and toxicity issues associated with that chemical. An MSDS for any chemical in your lab can be looked up directly on Miami's EHSO website or by contacting the chemical manufacturer. 
Transport and storage are two of the most common sources of chemical exposures. Use a rubber bucket, like that shown here, when transporting acids and bases. The buckets are pliable, offering the container protection from breakage, and it will contain a spill should a bottle break during transport. When transporting multiple chemicals, use a cart. Store chemicals according to their hazard class. At a minimum, store flammable liquids, water reactants, acids, bases, and oxidizers separately in their own designated areas. Date peroxide forming compounds such as ethyl ether and other chemicals that may become unstable over time. Flammable liquids should always be stored in a separate cabinet away from other chemicals. These chemicals can easily start a fire if they are stored with incompatible chemicals such as inorganic acids or peroxides. Be certain to recap solvent bottles immediately after dispensing and return them to their proper storage area as soon as possible. When working with acids, it is important to remember to never add water to an acid. The ionization of water as it is added to acid releases a large amount of heat, which can potentially boil the solution rapidly and splash concentrated acid out of the container. Always add acid to water and never the reverse. Some of the engineering controls available to help reduce your risk of exposure include chemical fume hoods and biological safety cabinets. Class I biological safety cabinets are essentially a chemical fume hood with a filtered exhaust. The most commonly used biological safety cabinets are Class II. All Class II cabinets offer product, personnel, and environmental protection. Class III cabinets are gas-tight, absolute containment enclosures, which provide a physical barrier between the user and highly infectious agents. Neither Class I nor Class III cabinets are used at Miami. In the next few slides, we'll review some of the safety aspects and limitations you should be aware of when using these controls. Chemical fume hoods operate by pulling a steady flow of air away from the breathing zone and exhausting it outside the building. They should be used when working with anything volatile that can create an airborne hazard, such as acids or solvents. The hood sash should be kept closed when the hood is not in use. This helps to conserve energy by reducing the amount of conditioned air that is exhausted from the building. When working in the hood, keep the sash as low as possible. This helps to minimize the potential for airborne hazards to escape the hood and provides a physical barrier should the materials you are working with react violently. Work as deeply in the hood as possible to reduce the potential for materials to escape while maintaining a minimum of four inches between you and the front of the hood. If electrical devices are going to be used in the hood, make sure the cords are running underneath the sash rest. This way the cords can't be damaged by the sash and the sash can still be closed completely. Do not use the hood as a chemical storage cabinet. Only chemicals that are currently in use should be placed in the hood. Having excess chemicals stored in the hood only increases your chances of having an accident. All Class II biological safety cabinets use high-efficiency particulate air filters, also known as HEPA filters, to clean the air. These filters remove fine particulates but cannot remove gases or volatile organics from the air. The air is filtered before it passes over the work area and then again before it is exhausted out of the cabinet. Since both A1 and A2 cabinets exhaust air directly into the laboratory, they are not designed for use with volatile organic compounds. The B1 cabinets exhaust 70% of the air directly to the outdoors through the exhaust stack located on top of the unit. These cabinets are designed to allow the use of small quantities of volatile toxic chemicals and trace amounts of radionuclides. Type B2 cabinets are referred to as total exhaust cabinets and are not currently used on campus. This is a clean bench and should not be confused with a biological safety cabinet. It is designed to blow HEPA filtered air from the back of the unit across the work surface 
into the worker's breathing zone. This type of bench is for product protection only and should never be used for personal protection. We will now review the variety of personal protective equipment available for use in the laboratory. It is important to make sure you are using the proper equipment to protect you from the particular hazards you are exposed to in your research. In the next few slides, we will review proper choice of clothing, eye, and hand protection. The clothes you wear provide an important layer of protection. Long pants or skirts that cover the ankle are strongly recommended. Lab coats are an especially good idea when the risk of exposure is high. Sandals or open-toed shoes should never be worn when working with chemicals. Closed-toe shoes are mandatory. Laboratory science is very visual, and as such, the eyes are often most at risk. By state law, some form of eye protection in the laboratory is mandatory at all times. Safety goggles are required whenever there is a risk of a chemical splash. Safety glasses are permitted for laboratory work where physical hazards are present, but no splash hazard exists. This slide visually demonstrates the various levels of protection offered by safety glasses, safety goggles, and face shields. Each mannequin head was fitted with a different type of protection prior to exploding an orange dye bomb in front of it. The first three heads were fitted with various types of safety glasses. As you can see, all three offered immediate protection to the eye but allowed dye to penetrate under the glasses. That is why safety glasses are not sufficient where a splash hazard exists. Mannequins 4 and 5 were fitted with safety goggles which did an excellent job of protecting the entire area around the eye. Mannequin 6 demonstrated the benefit of using a half face shield, while mannequins 7 and 8 were fitted with full face shields. Which level of protection is necessary depends on the level of the exposure hazard and the inherent hazards of the chemicals involved. Your hands are the other obvious area that needs protection when you are working with chemicals. The two most common types of gloves used in laboratories are latex and nitrile. Latex gloves are almost always some shade of white, while nitrile gloves come in a variety of different colors, usually shades of blue. Keep in mind that due to skin allergies, some people can't wear latex, and that there are some chemicals that neither latex nor nitrile can offer adequate protection from. If you are going to be using a particularly hazardous chemical, take the time to consult a glove chart to determine the best type of glove to use for your specific chemical. The chart on this slide shows various types of gloves and what general types of chemicals they are resistant to, and those chemicals for which they are not recommended. This chart is available at the EHSO website. You can also obtain chemical-specific glove charts directly from chemical and glove manufacturers. Always be sure to thoroughly wash your hands after handling chemicals, even if you are wearing gloves. When wearing gloves, you should always assume that they could be contaminated. Don't work with chemicals wearing gloves, then work on a computer still wearing the gloves. Most importantly, never wear your gloves outside of the lab where you could potentially contaminate common surfaces, such as doorknobs or drinking fountains. Remember, the gloves are inexpensive. By trying to save a few pennies, you are exposing all other people who contact that surface to the same chemicals you are trying to protect yourself from. Be courteous. Remove your gloves and discard them before you leave the laboratory. Waste management is key to the safe operation of a laboratory. This is especially important in an academic or industrial setting where many labs are collected in one building engaged in a wide array of research activities. All wastes need to be segregated and labeled properly in sealable, leak-tight containers. Record the name and amount of each chemical as it is added to the waste container. Make sure the type of container being used is compatible with the type of waste being stored. For example, hydrofluoric acid should never be stored in a glass container, as it can dissolve glass. Always label the container with the proper chemical name not the chemical formula. 
All wastes are managed by EHSO. When you have a waste container that needs disposal, visit the EHSO website and fill out a waste pickup request. Remember that if you are working with infectious agents, arrangements will have to be made to dispose of your waste appropriately. No matter how careful we are, accidents happen. Therefore, it is important that all lab workers know how to respond to an emergency. Every lab worker should be able to determine if a small spill can be cleaned up safely. If the spill is large or of an extremely hazardous nature, contact EHSO for assistance. When faced with fire, only attempt to extinguish a small fire if you have been trained to do so. Otherwise, leave the area via the nearest exit and be sure to pull the fire alarm on your way out of the building. For chemical exposure to the skin or the eyes, it is important to respond immediately. For exposure to the skin, you should remove any contaminated clothing and thoroughly flush the affected area for 15 minutes. If the exposure covered a large area of your body or was particularly hazardous in nature, you should wash in an emergency shower for 15 minutes. For splashes to your eyes, hold your eyelids open and wash your eyes with a gentle stream of water for 15 minutes. In any case, you should seek medical treatment after washing the affected areas. For minor cuts and abrasions, on-the-spot treatment is sufficient. However, if the injury is of a more serious nature, call 911 immediately. In either case, if you choose to assist, you should take universal precautions. That is, you should assume that all human blood and any body fluid visibly contaminated with blood is infected by bloodborne pathogens. As we said at the beginning of this training session, it is common for students, especially those just starting out, to be uncomfortable or even embarrassed asking for help when they are uncertain of something or when they are concerned about the safety of a situation or procedure. When it comes to safety, mistakes can have severe consequences. So if you have any uncertainties or any questions, it is your responsibility to raise them. Ask another student or a faculty member for your safety and for the safety of others. Remember, when in doubt, ask.